bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode 32, brought to you by Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, cooksholsters.com. Well, for those of you new to the show, welcome. Here at Armed Lutheran Radio, we discuss faith, firearms, and the Second Amendment in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the confessions of the Lutheran Church. We discuss competition, hunting, gun reviews, training, and the ethical issues surrounding guns, gun ownership, and self-defense. The show airs every Monday, and every week I'm joined by a great cast of contributors whose experience crosses the spectrum of the gun world. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a... Uh, Metropolitan Police Officer, and he is uh, was the first to join the crew. He uh, uh, brings us a ballistic minute, uh, which are tips and tricks for competitive shooting. Aaron Israel is the owner of Fundamental Defense and a combat-focused shooting certified instructor, and he brings us weekly self-defense tips. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota, and every week... In our Clinging to God and Guns segment, he and I discuss articles which misuse scripture to support gun control. And our newest contributor brings a feminine touch to the show. Mia Anstein is a hunting guide, a writer and a speaker, a mom, and an archery and firearms instructor. She's also the first American woman to ever appear on the cover of Field and Stream magazine. And we have guest interviews, gun reviews, we have commentary on news and events, and a whole lot more. Uh, We hope you like what we're doing, and you'll leave us a comment or a voice message. Check out the feedback page on the website. Go to armedlutheran.us, click on the feedback link at the top of the page. Uh, There you can send us an email, or you can leave us a voice message. Or drop by iTunes, leave us a review, we'd really appreciate that as well. So what's new with all of you? Well, I got a little dry fire done this past week, trying to get ready for nationals, IDPA nationals in September. Finally got uh, got paid, so I was able to send off uh, uh, registration for the battle in Benton next month. I'm really looking forward to that. It's one of my favorite matches every year. Uh, It was one of the first ones that I shot uh, when I moved, after I moved to Texas, and it's been an absolute favorite of mine uh, ever since uh, ever since I started shooting regularly on the IDPA circuit here in the um, in the Southwest, I uh, got to the range for a change. It was nice. Um, had a nice day at the range. It was in the uh, mid 80s. Uh, wasn't terrible. I uh, got out there and spent about three and a half hours just running drills, hoping to improve my movement between points of cover, trying to keep the gun high moving between points of cover so I could more easily get the gun on target. I detailed the drill that I was running in last week's newsletter. I hope you'll visit the website. If you'd like to subscribe, click on the Get the Newsletter link in the menu at the top of the page. We send out uh, regular updates of what's going on here at Armed Lutheran Radio. Uh, And we launched a new show called Midweek Meditations, which will be um, a single segment just a chance to air some extra content that may get cut from the Monday show because of time constraints, or if some big event happens at the end of the week and I want to comment on it, but it's just too late to re-edit the show, uh, it'll end up in the midweek meditation. Check that out and let me know what you think. I hope you like it. And Pastor John Bennett of uh, St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota, is not able to join us again today. Uh, if you followed on Facebook, I posted, uh, just shared a post from Pastor Bennett asking for your prayers. He and his wife are um, dealing with some medical issues with uh, their daughter, Mary Alice. And I would ask that uh, you keep Pastor Bennett and his uh, family and Mary Alice in your prayers during this uh, difficult time. We look forward to having Pastor Bennett back on when uh, everything is 
back to normal. And um, Mary Alice is uh, feeling better. So get better, Mary Alice. And um, Pastor Bennett, we love you. We miss you. And uh, we look forward to talking to you soon. Okay, on today's show, here's what we've got in store for you. Sergeant Bill is up first, and he talks about calling your shots in practice and competition, how to develop that skill. Mia Anstein will be talking about when to present your firearm in an emergency. And Aaron Israel discusses the myth of the bad guy. Too often, the bad guy is not some random stranger. It's somebody that you know. And is gun violence making you a nervous wreck? Well, a professor at Rutgers University suggests that the way to counter that is turning off the news. But special guest Pastor Evan Gegline joins us to discuss how to deal with fear and worry and why burying our head in the sand is just not a solution. All that's straight ahead, right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. With those words, our founding fathers changed the world. They launched an experiment in freedom, where common lawful citizens are free to speak and gather and worship as they choose. But first among those freedoms is the one freedom that makes the rest possible. For 130 years, we've worked to preserve freedom first. I'm Wayne LaPierre of the National Rifle Association. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. This is Sergeant Bill with your Ballistic Tip. Today's topic is going to be calling your shot. Some people think calling your shot is an advanced technique. Honestly, it is, but it's something you really need to learn pretty quickly if you're a defensive shooter or a competition shooter because it will definitely enhance your shooting ability tremendously. Now, calling your shot is actually seeing your sight picture right as the gun fires. Um, It's not checking your target after you fired the shot. A shooter that's calling his shots is not looking at the target. He's looking at his sights, firing the shot, and then he's going to move on to the next one. He's not going to stop, pause, look at the target, and see where his shots landed, and then move on. You can check all those when you're done. Now, calling your shot is something you can practice to a degree in dry fire, but you really need live fire to cement this technique, to get this ability down. I don't really think this is a kind of ability that anyone is or has got it down 100%. Calling your shot is something kind of like marksmanship. It's something you're always going to work on. You're always going to be striving to call your shots better and better. Okay, now there's a drill for learning how to call your shot. Uh, At this drill, what you do is you put a target down range at, say, 15 yards maybe 20. Somewhere where if you shoot the target you're gonna have a hard time seeing where your shots are landing until you get closer. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a pen and a piece of paper. On that piece of paper you're gonna basically draw your target and after each shot you're gonna stop, pick up your pen, and write or mark that target where you fired your shots, where you called it, where you saw them the instant the gun fired. After you've done five or ten shots, maybe less, depends on how many you want to do, go downrange, check your work, check your target, see how close you were. You keep doing this, and it's going to start having a correlation. You're going to start figuring it out. You're going to start seeing the sights better just as the trigger breaks, just as that gun fires, and you're going to have a really good idea where your shot goes. Now, I've been shooting competitively for about four years. I've been a pistol and rifle shooter for, wow, 20 plus years. Um, This is something that I've literally learned in the last year to two years. I'd heard about it before, but I guess I didn't really understand what it meant. 
Um, and the more I've done it, the more you realize you can really see with really good accuracy. The more you do it, the more you practice at it, you can get really good at knowing right where your shot goes. You're not always going to be 100% correct. I mean, there's, you know, so many factors involved with, you know, pistol marksmanship, especially when you're shooting practical pistol or defensive training, because you're going to be shooting fast you're going to be moving fast and a lot of things happen but the more you do it the more you train your eyes to see what you need to see i've heard some of the top level competitive shooters can pretty much score their runs by the time they're done shooting it they don't have to go back and they can almost point out oh yeah i was one down over here and oh i was three down there or i missed that target there because they're calling their shot they're really good at it lots of practice now, if you've tried this drill and you're trying to do this and you're having some problems with this, there's some things you can kind of check off the list to see if you're doing this and maybe this is giving you a problem. Um, one thing you can do right away is double plug. Put foam ear plugs in, put some muffs over your ears, so that way you're not getting a reaction to the recoil of the gun. Uh, another thing you can do is put a camera on a tripod and set it up in front of you but a little bit off to the side and zoom it in so you can kind of see your face you want to see if you're blinking you may be blinking when you fire the shot now that's going to be a really hard one to fix um, you basically have just got to practice shooting maybe not even with a target and just force yourself to hold your eyes open the double plugging with the earmuffs and the earplugs can help this as well because a lot of time it's the loud noise, the shock of the gun recoiling and going off in your hand that can cause that kind of reaction and you've got to learn or train yourself to overcome that. Maybe you have a vision issue. Get your eyes checked. Try different lenses. If you have um, multi-lens glasses, bifocals, trifocals, um, I've seen guys that, and I've even tried this, you put a like scotch tape on your non-dominant eye on the lens of your shooting glasses, even if you don't have prescription glasses, and you'll be able to shoot that way with both eyes open. You see more, and you're less likely to have your eyes squinted up already and to blink or anything that might cause you to not be able to see what your sights are doing. Now if you're not having any blinking or vision issues, you might have a grip issue. You might be squeezing the gun harder as you're pulling the trigger harder. Um, you might be milking the trigger or you might have just very little recoil control and the gun's recoiling so much that you're almost anticipating it and you're not seeing where the sights were at that last instant before the gun fired. Check these things out. See what you can do. But you really, really need to call your shot. This has been your Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill. Planning to head outdoors today? The National Shooting Sports Foundation reminds you to check the fire danger levels in your area. Whether target shooting, camping, or even parking a car with a hot exhaust, remember to take precautions. If you're going shooting in dry conditions, minimize the possible risk of fire by not using steel jacketed or steel core ammunition, tracer rounds, or exploding targets. As we know, wildfires have many possible causes. Don't be one of them. This is Brandon War, host of the War Zone Radio podcast, reminding you that life is a war zone, so it's best to always be armed, first with God's Word, then with a trusty firearm, and by listening to the Armed Lutheran Podcast. Up next, it's Mia's Motivations with Mia Anstein. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here chatting with you again. I am scrolling through the timelines on the social media, and among the Trump and Hillary memes, I've also seen a few self-defense stories shared, and actually one of them is a lack of self-defense. But one was about an intruder who <clears throat> was presented with a warning shot in these people's house, and the intruder neglected to retreat, he proceeded to move ahead and was faced with not just the barrels of three guns, but with bullets from three guns. 
Everyone in that house was armed and knew what to do with the firearm. In another story, which Lloyd and Aaron shared on the timeline over at the Facebook, it was about a couple who was relaxing, unarmed, in the shade of their garage, only to be overtaken and then eaten, yes, eaten, by an assailant. If you want to find that entire story, you can visit BearingArms.com. That story is a grim one. But with more and more tales of people's personal space being invaded and violence occurring, it simply makes sense to take up arms and defend ourselves and our loved ones. I know more than one house in which if you were entered uninvited and threatening someone's life, you would be met with the muzzle of a gun. As gun owners, there is something to consider in this aspect, and that is Do we always have to fire? Something that a lot of people don't think about is when to retreat. And the fifth commandment says, thou shall not murder. And that means that we should not hurt or harm our neighbors. Well, if somebody is entering our home and presenting evil upon us, then they obviously are not a neighbor. They're not our friend. They are threatening our lives, and even though the commandment says you're not to murder, that's not murder, it's self-defense. In that note, I sent my daughter to a firearms class. Actually, she was invited by Remington Arms Company to go to a firearms class at Gunsight Academy. And as a mother, it's really empowering to see your daughter empowered, and she learned how to defend herself with a handgun. But I don't want to give any spoilers if you've never taken a defensive handgun course. The final in this class, they took them through um, clearing clearing scenarios in the outdoors, and they also took them through clearing scenarios in the house. And although she did pass the outdoor one, in the indoor, she passed, but there is a scenario where... Instead of pulling her firearm when somebody was intruding in the house, she could have retreated, used her telephone to call for help, and then waited with her firearm to defend herself if necessary. So my tip for the day is run through these scenarios in your mind. Do you always have to take someone else's life? And if you're going to take up your arms and defend yourself and take someone's life, what are the consequences going to be afterwards? Think about scenarios where if somebody is armed and robbing a convenience store, does that mean you have to pull your firearm as well? Think about this. If they simply come in, take the money, and leave, did you have to pull your firearm? So this is your homework. Run through these scenarios in your mind and determine when you have to present your gun. We don't always have to pull our firearms and we don't always have to shoot. So that's your homework and I hope that it helps you in your firearms training and techniques and I will see you next week. Have an awesome one. Bye. Your support is vital to this Christian-centered pro-gun ministry. Help support Armed Lutheran Radio by visiting patreon.com forward slash armed Lutheran and become a sponsor today. Gun worshipers, gun humpers, ammo sexuals, gun fetishists, These are just a few of the things that gun owners and gun enthusiasts are routinely called by gun control supporters. And it it irritates me to no end. Not because I'm so thin-skinned as to take it personally, but because it's a horrible violation of the Eighth Commandment. And I know the kinds of people that they're talking about. And it angers me to hear my friends and the people that I respect be insulted by a bunch of people who wouldn't know their butt from a hole in the ground when it comes to guns. If you visit the website, the Twitter feed, or the Facebook pages of any of the major gun control groups, you'll see what I mean. The Eighth Commandment says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
And here's Dr. Martin Luther from the Large Catechism explaining the meaning of the Eighth Commandment. In the first place, he says, we take the plainest meaning of this commandment according to the words, thou shalt not bear false witness, as pertaining to the public courts of justice. But there are other explanations and other meanings that Dr. Luther explains in further detail. What concerns us all, this commandment forbids all sins of the tongue, whereby whereby we may injure or approach too closely to our neighbor. For to bear false witness is nothing else than a work of the tongue. Now, whatever is done with the tongue against a fellow man, God would have prohibited, whether it be false preachers with their doctrine and blasphemy, false judges and witnesses with their verdict, or outside of court by lying and evil speaking. Here belongs particularly the detestable shameful vice of speaking behind a person's back and slandering to which the devil spurs us on and of which there would be much to be said. For it is a common evil plague that everyone prefers hearing evil to hearing good of his neighbor. It really pains me to hear and read some of the vile and despicable things that gun control supporters say about gun rights activists and gun owners and NRA members. Because I can tell you unequivocally that these are some of the finest people that I've ever met. And I would not have been so fortunate to meet them And to have them as part of my life were it not for the guns that gun control groups hate so much. See, because I shoot guns, I've been blessed to get to know some truly awesome people. They say the Pledge of Allegiance and they pray for all the shooters who are taking part in matches. They go out of their way to make you feel welcome. In 2012, long before I moved to Texas, my son and I took a road trip from North Carolina all the way to Zavala, Texas, which is in South Texas, down towards Houston. We went to Dustin Ellerman's very first youth marksmanship camp. And for those of you who don't know who Dustin Ellerman is, he won, uh, he was the winner, I think, of season three of the reality show um, Top Shot on the History Channel. And he is a Christian camp counselor. He runs a a Christian youth camp in Zavala, Texas. And he decided to start hosting a youth marksmanship camp, and he hosts two or three of these every year. And um, it was just a, a real blessing to meet and to get to know Dustin and to watch him interact with the kids. And all of that was possible thanks to guns. The first time I went to shoot a local match with the Collin County IDPA guys in uh, Greenville, Texas, back in 2013, my gun failed. It crapped the bed. The firing pin spring sprang its last. I was there with my son, Reagan, and... Um, When the gun crapped out on me, I just packed up my gear and figured, well, I'll just watch the rest of the match and encourage Reagan, help him out. But no, Alan Honeyman went to his truck and brought me a Glock 34 and a holster. No background check required. And I was able to finish the match. In states like Oregon or Washington State, that would have been a felony. God bless Texas. When I needed to shoot a classifier in time for a a match, and there was not a a classifier locally, I drove all the way to Tyler, Texas, about two hours away, and I met Steve Prater and his IDPA club, and he rescheduled their classifier just so Reagan and I could come and shoot with them. That was really awesome. Through email and then face-to-face, I got to know David Habig, who is the match director for a Benton Gun Club in Benton, Arkansas. Um, he was planning the very first battle in Benton IDPA Regional. Um, now coming up on the third installment this September, it's one of my favorite matches every year, and David is 
just a great guy. In 2014, Reagan and I drove all the way to Como, Mississippi. It's an eight-hour drive for the Mississippi Showdown. Let me get that right. Mississippi Showdown. And I got to meet Will Schmied. And I am blessed to consider Will and his wife, Chris, to be friends. And I always enjoy seeing them. Last year when I shot the Mississippi match, Reagan did not shoot, but he came with me. And he got a tad overheated in the Mississippi heat. And Will's wife, Chris, took him into the scoring shack where they had air conditioning and kept him cool. Gave him cold towels to cool him off and some Gatorade and some water to drink. I'll never forget that. I've been blessed to become good friends with Sergeant William Sylvia. You may know him as Sergeant Bill from the show. Every match that I've shot with Bill on my squad has been an absolute blast. Except for Badlands this year. (laughs) When he got DQ'd like three stages in. Other than that, it's been great. The guy is hilarious to be around. Absolutely the most fun I've ever had shooting has been in matches squatted with Bill. He's got a wealth of knowledge about reloading that he is just loves to share. I don't think I will ever forget the trip that we took in, in that RV to the Arkansas state match this year. He and his wife, Kat are two of the best people you could ever hope to meet. And I got to know him because of guns. At the Badlands match in 2014, there were a couple of guys from Iowa who wandered all the way down nearly 10 hours to Tulsa to shoot the match. One of them was kind of quiet, nice guy. The other was talkative and outgoing. Both of them super nice. We hit it off pretty quick. Billy Wideline and Scott Longhorn have been friends ever since, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have met them and to count them as friends. And this year... I returned the favor, drove all the way to Iowa and shot the match that where Billy was the match uh, assistant match director and Scott was um, one of the um, SOs. And they took my advice on building stages, which was awesome. Every time I go to a match, I meet new people. And they're just awesome people. They're great people. Arnold Brown and all of his foot photos... You hand him a a camera and ask him to take pictures and you'll inevitably end up with photos of his feet and, you know, thumbs and all kinds of stuff. Distinguished master Matt Childress is amazing to watch shoot. Estuardo Balderas, everybody calls him Stu, is another one. Um, Mike Plato of Central Arkansas Shooters Association, great guy. Collin County IDPA President Cody Ray and his wife Margo, two of the nicest people I've met. Keith Harper I met uh, back in North Carolina when I was uh, shooting a classifier with the Foothills Defensive Shooters. Nick Dumont, Henneke Abibi, uh, Alan Motter, Lewis Freeman, TJ Kane, um, Mandy Bachman, the home ec teacher whose alter ego is a Badass Wilson combat sponsored shooter. Adam Roof, Jerry Weiss, Bora Angel, Wolf Laughlin. Great people. And thanks to guns, I got into blogging and now podcasting. I've put together a cast of amazing contributors. In addition to the aforementioned Bill Sylvia, Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense, Mia Anstein, Pastor John Bennett, Wonderful people that I would never have gotten the chance to know had it not been for guns and the issue of gun rights. When the anti-gun zealots, the people who know absolutely nothing about guns, want to ban them, want to limit access to them, the people who are scared of these inanimate objects and freak out over gun violence, when they insult and they belittle gun enthusiasts, these are the people they're talking about. When Hillary Clinton talks about how proud she is that she made the NRA her enemy, these are the people she's talking about. Just stop and think about all the people in your life that you've gotten to know, thanks to guns. And now consider 
that those are the people that people like Hillary Clinton are insulting. They're soldiers, they're sailors, police officers, pilots, preachers, teachers, truck drivers, husbands, wives, parents. Some of the finest, most considerate, safety-conscious, most patriotic people you would ever meet. So yeah, when I hear them insulted, it gets under my skin. It's time for this week's self-defense tip from Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense. Hey folks, this is Aaron Israel with Fundamental Defense here with your personal defense tip of the week. Earlier this week I had a father call me about doing a private lesson with his college-age daughter who has recently been licensed to carry and plans to carry on her college campus now that it's legal to do so in the state of Texas. During the course of our short conversation, this father astutely observed that the most likely threats his daughter would face would come in the form of people she probably knows or would meet at college, and specifically he mentioned the guy who can't take no for an answer as a prime potential threat. I was very encouraged to talk to this dad because he really gets it. He's looked beyond the simple idea of being armed and expanded his thought process to being prepared for what is most likely to happen to his daughter in her daily life at a university. If he's having these conversations with his daughter, then she's going to be far more prepared than most people are when they go to a college campus. My conversation with this wise father reminded me of the fact that a lot of people just don't really have a good understanding of where attacks are likely to come from. We spend a lot of time talking about and preparing for the guy who jumps out of the bushes, or the person who accosts us in the parking lot and robs us, or the active shooter, but we tend to neglect spending much time and energy preparing ourselves for the far more likely circumstance of needing to protect ourselves from someone we know or interact with familiarly as a part of our daily life. I've been on a recent binge-watching spree of true crime documentaries on Netflix, like Forensic Files and stuff like that, and a common trend I've noticed is that for every case where a stranger murders or assaults someone, there are ten other cases where the assailant is known to the victim. The reality is is that how well you manage the contacts you have with people in your day-to-day life will do far more to benefit you from a personal defense perspective than your training with your firearm ever can or will. Going back to the college context, a lot of listeners of this program probably have college-age kids, or you may be one yourself. Hopefully we got some college-age kids listening to the show. Personal defense in that environment, as with any other, starts with making good decisions about who you allow into your circle and who you allow to have your confidence and place your trust in. Making this decision to not have that extra drink or not walk outside with that guy could make the difference between being victimized or not, right, and having to fight with somebody or not having to fight with somebody. While it's never the fault of the victim when they are physically or sexually assaulted, and in no way should we shame the victims of these crimes, there are things we can learn about the circumstances leading up to these assaults. Whether you're in a college campus or just going about your daily routine in the workplace or whatever, you need to be careful about who you're interacting with, where you're interacting with them, and who you place your trust in, most importantly. Not only does this apply to people that are in the workspace or uh, out in the college campuses, but this applies to parents of younger children as well. My daughter is about to start kindergarten at a public school next week. How many times in the recent past have you heard about horrific assault cases involving teachers and caretakers? You can bet that me and my wife are going to be involved as far as knowing who her teachers are, knowing who her coaches are, knowing who her uh, her tutors are, and that sort of thing, and making sure we have as much foreknowledge and interaction with these people as possible to do our best to positively control these situations as much as we can for when our child is not with us and with these caretakers. Even beyond the schoolhouse, you may have relatives with known issues. Uh, You might have that weird uncle or weird cousin who there's just something not right about him, who you can't trust your kids to be around them without close supervision or maybe not even at all. We all have to be vigilant about these things because if you look at the statistics, these are where these assaults, these are where these murders, these are where these kidnappings usually come from. It's not usually the mythical guy in the bushes. It's usually someone you know or interact with on a daily basis. So my charge to you... As a responsible armed citizen, whether you have kids or not, is to pay attention to who you're interacting with. 
Be careful about giving too much trust or letting your guard down, and take the same attitude on behalf of your kids if you had kids as they go into this school year, whether it's to a grade school, elementary school, high school, a college. Talk to them about these things. Talk to them about managing their contact with other people and not giving up their trust so easily. And if something about the circumstances or the people you're around just doesn't feel right, you need to trust your instincts and get out of that situation because the mythical bad man in the bushes isn't your primary threat. It's the bad man that you interact with every day. That's your personal defense tip for the week. Thanks for tuning in. On last week's show, episode 31, Aaron Israel talked about limiting administrative handling of your firearm to reduce chances of a negligent discharge. Well, that's one of the things that I love about my everyday carry holsters from Cook's Holsters. I carry my Glock 19 in a Cook's IWB holster with the adjustable belt clip. The clip allows you to adjust the gun on your your belt. It allows you to adjust the cant of the gun. Um, the holster is custom molded to fit my gun perfectly. And because the clip is not a closed loop, I can easily remove the gun and the holster from my waistband without handling the gun itself. If I'm in a public restroom, like Aaron was talking about, or leaving the gun in the car when I have to go into a gun-free zone, like a post office or, or a school, the gun never comes out of the holster and they can easily be stowed and then reinserted back into my waistband when I'm done. Check out the Cook's IWB holster with the Ulti clip. This replaces the the belt clip, the standard plastic belt clip, with a metal clip that clamps down and holds on tight. Now, this is an interesting design. When when I first got the holster, I really wasn't sure I liked the system, but I figured out I wasn't using it right. The clip works great when you clamp it down on a pocket, a thin Uh, layer of fabric inside your backpack or a purse or a briefcase or the waistband of your pants. Used with the right gun and the right pair of pants or shorts, you can clip the holster to your waistband and carry it without the need for a belt. I use it around the house with my M&P shield. Cook's holsters are made in the USA, custom molded to fit your firearm exactly, and they come with a lifetime warranty against defects and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. I've used them for years. I trust them. That's why I asked them to sponsor the program, and that's why I recommend them to you. Visit cooksholsters.com today. Use the promo code ARMEDPODCAST and get 15% off everything in the store. If you're going to carry a firearm for self-defense, look, here's what you need to do. Buy a quality firearm. Pay for a quality uh, training, like the training offered by Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense, and get a quality holster from cooksholsters.com. Pistols, prayer, and potluck. This is Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Joining us again is Pastor Evan Gegline of Faith Lutheran Church in Rogue River, Oregon, and the co-host of Table Talk Radio. Pastor, welcome back to the show. Lloyd, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me back. Sure. I came across a couple of articles this past week that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, One is from a a New Jersey radio station's website uh, entitled, Is Gun Violence Making You a Nervous Wreck? Turn off the news, Rutgers expert says. And the article sort of starts out like this. Whether it's halfway around the world in the Middle East, in France or Germany, or closer to home in Dallas, Louisiana, Florida, or right here in New Jersey— Again, this is a New Jersey radio station. Gun violence seems to be a never-ending threat these days. Um, They do go on to quote some stats from the Brady campaign, some statistics from the FBI, but they do, uh, and then they get to the, the professor, and she says that, you know, all this constant exposure that we get to gun violence can be distressing to many people. She says it's painful to watch people suffer, and it's even more painful when these you see these images repeatedly Um, They point out rightly that data shows that crime is declining in much of America, but many people think the opposite because of the constant news coverage. And we saw last week 
an incident in Raleigh, North Carolina, and at JFK International Airport in New York, where people got you know freaked out and panicked because they thought they heard gunshots. Uh, they evacuated the part of the airport. They evacuated this mall. Um, in both cases, people panicked, but there was no gunman. There, nobody was shot. Um, it was just um, rampant fear of of gun violence. Bob Owens at BearingArms.com wrote a piece and called it uh, Chicken Little America. Pastor, the, the professor suggests that turning off the news is the answer, but we can't ignore the world around us completely. Um, the news media and activist groups want us to be fearful, so we'll, we'll support their, whatever their agenda is. How should we think about these news stories, these, especially when they take place in familiar places? You know, it's, it's, it's one thing when we hear about um, an attack in France or Africa or somewhere far away, but when it's close to home, it's particularly unsettling. So, you know, how do we as Christians handle um, these sorts of fearful, scary news events? Well, I suppose that the one way suggested would be to uh, find a hole in the sand and just stick your head in it. <laughs> um, but I'm not sure how effective or realistic that is. Um, and, and I think that the, the point that you're making uh, here is that uh, to, to just sort of ig- ignore the, uh, the evil that's around in the world, um, you'll, you'll never be able to remove yourself from all the evil. And this maybe, uh, this is, maybe goes with the point that I, I think that you're kind of drawing out in, in, in the story. I remember, um, I think it was the, the week of the uh, horrific uh, uh, Newtown shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, that that same week, and and the details are, are are a little hazy. I think it was in China or or another another country overseas. That the same week, a man walked into a school, and uh, and started swinging a hammer and killed a bunch of people by swinging a hammer. And um, of course, that was overshadowed by the story in our own our own country of of horrific gun violence. Mm-hmm. And I think that the reality, the point is, is that uh, whenever we think that. The, the problem is that the news is coming to us. <laughs> Bad things are happening, and so we need to, to cut ourselves off, off from the, the, uh, the news of, of the events happening to us. The reality is that they're still happening. <laughs> you know, right. They're still going on. And if, if you think, okay, I'm, I'm not going to uh, have anything to do with gun violence anymore, the reality is that there's still other bad things happening, um, evil in the world. And even if you want to take away try to ignore all of the um, evil intentions of evildoers, there's still uh, earthquakes and tornadoes, and there's still horrific <laughs> things happening at at no evildoer's hand. So um, first of all, we should talk about the reality is that you can't get away from it all. So that's the first thing. Right. Um, I th- additionally, I think the better thing would be to do is to learn how to deal with sort of bad news mm-hmm. versus ex- trying to escape it because that's just a losing battle. Right. So, so how do we, how do we deal with it? I mean, it, obviously worry and fear are natural human emotions. Everybody, everybody experiences them. My late grandmother was a worrier. Um, <laughs> if you didn't come home exactly when, when she expected you were going to be home, you'd find her standing at the door waiting for you. If you were running really late, she started calling everybody in the county to see if they knew where you were. Um, <laughs> my my in-laws are, are are devout Christians. They they go to they go to church twice a week. They they read the Bible all the time. They sing in the choir and yet they're worried about um flying to come, you know, to visit us in Texas. Um, my mom taught me that that you worry about the things that you can control and you put the rest in God's hands. Fear and worry are natural. How do we as Christians then deal with with those natural emotions that we're going to experience no matter how we separate ourselves from whatever, whether it's the news or not getting on an airplane, we're we're still going to experience it at one some point in our lives. Well, I think. Um uh, I, whoever was it, your mom that said to worry about the things in your yep. in your control. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's that that that's getting at something that interests me because um, when Jesus talked about worry, he he brought up a similar point. He says, "In all the worrying that you do, um, do you add e- even a, a single year to your life, or do you add a cubit to your life?" And of course, 
Uh, the answer is no. You're going to fret and worry and, and be concerned. And all that worrying really does nothing. I mean, you're still, <laughs> this, this, you're still a miserable wreck that you were before. It didn't, didn't help at all. Um, so that, that's maybe one thing. But uh, even if we're going to limit our worry to the things that, we, that are in our control, um, the reality is that, that we're still not all that better off by worrying those things, even that thing we can't control. <laughs> I mean, uh, if I, if I, okay, I'm only going to worry about the things that are within my control. Right. Um, that could still be disabling. I mean, I can control, um, how I, uh, how I drive my car, but I can't control the, the other drivers. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I, I, I think I'm a pretty good driver, but am I going to say that I'm never going to be the cause of an accident? I don't know that I can say that with, with, uh, with certainty. Um, so the point is, is that we aren't that trustworthy to say that the things in our control are not uh, worthy of our worry. Um, but, but rather, I think, um, I think the way that Jesus approaches this, at least, um, is, is that he, he points out that this worry that we have that we might think is natural points to a reality that is a, a, a deeper thing that we all, I mean, you might say, we all worry, so it must be natural. Jesus would say, uh, you worry, therefore you're a sinner. <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, I mean, this is the thing. When 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 we think someone's abnormal or normal, mm-hmm. we think, well, what is everybody else like? And so we would take <laughs> comfort in the fact that, well, everybody worries, so it must be normal and it must be natural. Um, but it's natural to sinners. Mm-hmm. It's not natural to who we were as created beings in the Garden of Eden. So we should start by saying that worry is not a, a good thing. Right. Um, so that so that Jesus would w- when he's talking about worry, um, he would uh, talk to those who he said, "Look, okay, look at the birds. You know, they're not uh, sowing or reaping. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't toil, uh, and yet God still provides for them. So what good is worrying?" And then he says, "You of little faith." So there's a connection then that our worry, even though we can say, "Well, everybody worries," well, of course they do because everybody sins. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the fact that we worry about things is to say that we are not in control, um, and so we have to worry. Uh, if if we can say that, well, I know that God has a lot for me. Um, that might not even be that everything is peachy my entire life. I might go go through terrible and awful things in my life. But the question is, even if the Lord would have it that I would go through terrible and awful things in my life, the question is, is he still my God? Is he still uh, going to keep his promises? Has Jesus still died for me? And if the answer is yes, then what great deal is this terrible thing that could possibly happen? Right. That makes me think of it. I received a letter from, I started to say a listener, it was a reader. This was in the pre-podcast days. He, he was a Christian. He was a gun owner. But he had some concerns. He had some questions. He was wondering if owning a gun for self-defense was somehow an admission that he his faith wasn't strong enough, that he didn't trust in God enough to protect him, that maybe his faith was weak. And I did my best to counsel him on that. And what would you say to somebody facing that kind of a doubt? If you got that kind of a question, what, what would you say to someone with that kind of doubt? That reminds me of a time I met a gentleman who was just kind of walking by the street on our uh, where our church is located, and uh, he said that um, he had some kind of uh, disease or illness or sickness or something like that, and that this uh, sickness um, was treatable. In fact, um, he could be completely uh, freed from this ailment, but he would have to go undergo surgery. And he said, and I, I didn't know this guy; I just met him that day. Uh, he said, uh, well, I don't think I'm going to do it because um, I think that I should trust in God for healing. And I tried to guide him <laughs> to the reality that uh, trusting in God for your healing might, uh, uh, that, that is to say, that, that he'll heal you immaterially, um, might result in your death. <laughs> and, and why is that? Well, there's the, there's the old story. Many people have heard this before, but I think it's actually, uh, it makes a good point. There's a guy who's, um, you know, standing on the roof of his house because the floodwaters are going up and up and up, and uh, he prays God, God, please rescue me. Mm-hmm. And then uh, some people come by with a boat. He says, "Quick, get in the boat!" 
And uh, he says, no, 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 uh, I pray to God God is going to save me. And then uh, pretty soon another boat comes by and says, quick, get in the boat. Uh, you're going to drown. He says, no, 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 I pray to God he's going to save me. And then pretty soon a helicopter comes and says, this is your last chance. You need to board the helicopter or else you're going to drown. He says, no, I pray to God. Um, God will rescue me. And then, then the man drowns and dies. And when he goes up to heaven, he asks God, he said, God, why didn't you rescue me? I asked you to rescue me. And God says, what do you mean? I sent two boats and a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a cheesy little story. Uh, but I think it actually makes the point that g- when God works and he is answering our prayers, he's working through means. Mm. So in the example of the joke, uh, okay, two boats and a helicopter were the means through which God was working to answer that man's prayer. Uh, with the gentleman that I met, um, the, he's you know praying to God for healing, and uh, and God sends doctors to perform a surgery that would that would uh, fix his ailment, whatever it is. So God is working through means. So to uh, to look to the means through which God is working to answer our prayers is not in any way a lack of faith or a lack of trust in God. Now, let's translate that to the situation uh, you brought up. Mm-hmm. Well, having a gun for self-defense, is that uh, somehow f- failing to trust in God? Well, in the other examples that I brought up, someone else was the means of, of God's work. In this case, uh, it's really the same. There's a means of God's work to, um, to protect us. Uh, it's just in this case, it's uh, maybe ourselves, or we could say the people who manufacture the gun. <laughs> right. That I can- I can thank God for gun makers and gun manufacturers mm-hmm. um, and legislators who protect my right to to carry a gun um, because they are doing God's work to protect me in a way that I can protect myself. Very good. Is that what you said? Is that, what, is that how you responded to the guy? <laughs> Very similar, but not quite as eloquent. Very. That was... oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's elegance, but if you say so. <laughs> no, you did a much better job than I did. I, I hope that I that I put his fears at ease. And I basically said the same. Look, God God gives us the the ability to to own a gun. He he puts us in a country where we can defend ourselves. Uh, we 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 can thank God that we have that ability to learn how to use a gun for self defense and the the legal right to do it. Um, so. Um, you know, he's not going to magically uh, show up on the doorstep and smite every person that comes to to, to harm us. That's mm-hmm. not the way it works. Um, he works through means, and that's uh, so. Well, and this kind of applies to the, our uh, the, your previous question about uh, worry. I mean, so so the reality is is that we're all going to worry because we're all sinners. I mean, if we perfectly uh, trusted in God then we would have no worry. Now, now I admit that, that a certain level of worry is a good thing because it, it, uh, it motivates us. You know? So uh, when I have a, a worry that something bad might happen, I'm more cautious, and, and that's, that's a good thing. But, but if, if we com- com- completely trusted in God, um, we, would, we would have no worry. So the fact that we do worry is a, a mark of sin. Now, when someone, if someone is, is completely worried, to just tell them, well, don't worry about it. That is hardly ever a comforting thing to hear. You know, you know when your wife is worried about something, you say, "Don't worry about it, dear." She she's not comfort. Oh, okay. I, well, since you told me not to worry, I guess I won't. Yeah, that I mean, never works. It never works, right? So, so what does work? I mean, what what is the solution to our worry? Well, it's not in telling someone to just not worry or don't worry about it. Uh, rather, I think that, um, and this is to go again to what what Jesus does. Uh, Jesus is pointing to the action that God has done for us. Um, so he again points to the the bird. Do the birds have food? Well, yes. Are the lilies taken care of? Well, yes. Uh, does the grass have the water it needs to grow? Yes. So if God's caring for such piddly little things as these, won't he also care for us? Mm-hmm. And when you think about this, I mean, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, I, I mean, I probably— say this to everyone I ever meet. <laughs> it's from, <laughs> from Romans chapter 8. And he says, um, God who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also uh, with him graciously give us all things? And so this is the picture. Uh, behind door number one is uh, us, uh, wretched, miserable, sinful, selfish human beings. And behind door number two is the Son of God in whom 
uh, God the Father is well pleased. Okay, these are his two options. Mm -hmm. Now, he can either uh, save, spare his son, save his dear beloved son by sending us to the wrath and punishment and hell that we deserve for our disobedience, or he could send his son to that peril, to that destruction, to that uh, wrath of God on the cross, thereby sparing us. And Romans 8 says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he with us also graciously give us all things? And of course, the answer is yes. <laughs> if, if he's going to send his son to die for us in order to spare us wretched sinners, then he's going to care for us in the things that we need to eat and to drink and, and clothing and shelter and the things that we're so worried about. So the answer into this is not, hey, just don't worry about that. The answer is, well, look to the cross. Look what Jesus has done for you. If he, is he going to go to the trouble to die for you and to rescue you from your sins and then abandon you when there might be a bad guy around the corner? Well, no, he's still with us, even if there's a bad guy around the corner. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Evan Gegline serves as the pastor at Faith Lutheran Church in Rogue River, Oregon. He's the co-host of the long-running theological game show podcast, Table Talk Radio. Pastor, thank you for joining us again today. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for another episode. Thank you for listening, downloading, and subscribing. If you've got any comments or questions or suggestions for topics that you'd like to hear us discuss here on the show, visit our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback and send us a voice message or an email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks to our contributors, Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense, Sergeant Bill Sylvia, and Mia Anstein for their contributions to the show today. And a special thanks to Pastor Evan Gegline of Faith Lutheran Church in Rogue River, Oregon, for being our special guest. And thank you for joining us this week. Until next week, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. Follow us on Twitter at Armed Lutheran. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash thearmedlutheran. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you for listening to Armed Lutheran Radio.